Welcome to Art and Scroll Studio. I'm Shelley Werner and the host of our Zoom series where we feature the makers and creators of Judaica art. Every month we celebrate a new artist in presentation and conversation. On Wednesday, January 19th, we featured Amy Golant as our special guest. What follows is the full episode as it appeared in January 2022. Did you always want to be an artist when you were young? Um, I don't, I can't say I thought I was going to be an artist. I always loved creating. I loved working with my hands and being outside, but I never guessed that I would become an artist. No, Not didn't have no idea what I was going to do. Well, I know we're going to get more into the direction that you did take, but I want to ask you, when you got into metal work, were you among many I mean, what was the diverse makeup of the class you were in at that time when you began to learn and how has it changed now? So at that time, I was taking a night class at San Francisco University. So it was kind of like a, like a one unit class because at a public university, it's hard for somebody in the early stages of college to even get into a regular art class. So those were mostly reserved for you know, seniors in college or juniors. Uh, so the classmate was made up of a combination of younger students like me and then just people from the community, adults, um, you know, I actually met one of my closest friends who I now consider my, my fairy godmother, Jennifer Cross Gans in that, in that class. And she was 50 years older than me. So, you know, it was, it was definitely a wide range of people who had interest in art and, um, who maybe were going to just take, the, take it for fun and others were art majors. So it was a nice combination. So you're saying it was diverse range. I was kind of expecting you to say it was all guys or oh. you know, women, but, and, and have you seen a change in that in your-, in, in your Well, as a teacher, sorry, I've noticed that there are mostly women who take the classes. We get a lot of architects and uh, people who are, you know, versed in architecture. I think the jeweler, the scale, scale of the jewelry um, sort of lends itself to smaller hands. Although there are some incredible jewelry masters who are men and some, including my husband, David, who teaches uh, metal work. So, but most of the classes I feel is skewed toward women with a few token men thrown in. That's interesting. I mean, I, I had no idea what the palette would be. Mm -hmm. and so I wanna ask you, I know you work in metal, but is being able to sketch and draw an important part of what you do? Well, it's especially important when you're working with other people because it, you know, if they have an idea, you wanna be able to express that idea on paper before you make it. Uh, but, and I actually, it's funny you mentioned about drawing because it's not my, one of my strongest skills. In fact, my drawing and painting teacher in college used my picture as an example of what not to do in front of the class and then told me privately later not to art major. So I actually did an art major. Uh, so, you know, three-dimensional drawing for an object that doesn't exist yet is tough for me. Uh, but I rely a lot on um, making paper models. Uh, paper models are great because it's three-dimensional and you can really get the feel of what the piece is gonna be. It's faster for me to do a paper model than it is to draw something. And it's easier for me to modify it with scissors or, you know, so I, I tend, I do have to do drawings, but I do tend to move towards uh, file folder material, which is a little thicker than paper and tape. Very interesting. And I, I think it's a, a unfortunate story, but true how many people's spirits have been crushed by people saying, no, you don't belong in the art world and how wrong they really are and how limited that vision is. So I know I'm a lot glad. of people who went to art school who then got out and never touched a paintbrush again, you know? So maybe I'm lucky I didn't go to art school. Who knows? Well, I, I feel that we are lucky. And, and my next question really leads me into our PowerPoint where we'll begin in a minute. But I know that you've grown so much from those early days and so much of your work has been uh, geared towards a purpose. So I want to ask you, do you feel art has a role in changing the world? <laughs> I'm going right there, Amy. I'm going to laugh because I wish, man, <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I, you know, what can I say? It does have a role. I mean, I just, I think about all the artists, particularly, I think musicians, to be quite honest, who have inspired me 
um, and music in general. Uh, and I feel like they're, they're somehow have the pulse on what we're all thinking and feeling and can sort of broadcast it out. And I do feel that I've used my art that way. And, and I have wanted to change the world. And I, you know, I hope so. <laughs> okay, good. I just thought we'd get on the same page right at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I hope so. Okay, let's let's use that as a springboard to look at some of the work. Okay. And thank you, by the way. And thank you to all the people who came to see me. I love you. Okay, and I thank them too. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so take us way back okay. to the beginning. And what did you make here and who are you with? So that's my, my, I love her. That's my teacher, Dawn Nakanishi. And she taught me metalwork at San Francisco State University. So she was our teacher at that night class. And she, she was the first person to ever show me how to do anything out of metal. And um, basically I was only 19 when I took that class and I was making everything with the symbol for peace on it. So you see that peace sign right there. That was the first piece of jewelry I ever made. And actually it was a locket. It opened up and it had a little box inside. And uh, you can see where I didn't really know very well how to solder because the brass and the silver got kind of crinkly there. Yeah, so that's what happened when you overheat your material and the two metals started to amalgamate. And I pulled my torch away just in time for it not to all just disintegrate right before my eyes. So that was a learning piece. but. The point is, is that I was really taken with peace. And my lovely teacher uh, was, was assigning this assignment to um, use, a, use a tool called a die and make a repetitive um, design. And I wanted to put peace signs on it. And she said, how can you express yourself without using a cliche? She, and, but she was very kind about it. You know, she didn't make me feel ashamed or anything. And she says, this is a college class. So what is it about peace? That's a great sentence and a great line that is, has inspired many people to look at the symbology that we have in our culture and to evaluate the fact that it is in fact a cliche and it's a symbol standing for something else. So the challenge is, how are you, where are you gonna take it on your own? But first let's step back into history. Okay. so. Well, actually that was the challenge. So I started to, to talk to her about why I was so taken with peace. And, you know, I sort of got this lump in my throat and I just mentioned that my grandparents were survivors of the Holocaust. And what I didn't tell her was at the same time as I was starting to learn and fall in love with the craft of metalwork, I was taking a class called Holocaust and Genocide. And I was going home to Los Angeles to interview my grandparents for that, for that class. And they, my grandfather was a precision tool and die maker, and he started giving me his tools. So there's a picture there of his tools. And uh, the picture above that is of my grandparents um, during the Holocaust in the ghetto on their wedding day. That's their wedding picture. And then the one next to that is him in, in one of his workplaces in New York, very happy uh, to be <laughs> away from the war and free in America. So, um, so I just said, you know, my grandparents were survivors of the Holocaust and I was, I was starting to have his tools and I was going from this class to my metalworking class. And so I just, you know, I was so taken with peace and I just couldn't, what am I gonna make? What am I gonna do? You know, she was very kind about it, but it, she gave me the weekend to think it over. So she basically rejected my project and said, think about it. That's a good teacher, by the way. She's a wonderful teacher. Wonderful. The best. Who sends you home and says, uh, do over. Needs work. So are we looking at something at the bottom here that we should talk about? So, yeah. So what happened there is it, it, it and also, so what happened there is that that became the idea for the piece. So that I was going to do. So I'm sorry if I'm not very articulate at the moment. I'm just trying to figure out how to say it. So I created a die, which is that form that looks kind of, you know, bulge there. And I was going to replicate that form uh, three times. And I decided I was going to make the case for mezuzah, that that was going to be how I was going to begin, like the tip of the iceberg to express what it was like to be a granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, 
be a Jew in America, wondering about God growing up and beginning to express those feelings through the metalwork, through my grandfather's tools and then this class. And so, you know, so that was, those, yeah. So those were my first pieces um, that I created in her class. Um, so this, so yeah, these are three. And tell me just a bit about the, the design concept. So, you know, most of the time, the mezuzah case, uh, basically there's a scroll inside there and it goes by the doorpost for those of you that are not sure what a mezuzah even is. So usually the holder of the mezuzah scroll uh, is beautiful and maybe even whimsical, um, maybe has some tablets on it, usually has the Hebrew letter shin on it. Um, but these were, you know, the shin was decaying and there was flames and jail bars and barbed wire. And so at the end of the class, when we all brought forth our pieces that we had created that semester. I talked about what the mezuzah was for the first time. And I explained to the class that I was grappling with wondering whether or not there was a God given the Holocaust. And to have these painful images on something so sacred was so powerful to me. And I felt so like I had a purpose to carry on the tradition, this Jewish tradition um, through my hands, given everything my grandparents had gone through. But at the same time, I, I wasn't wedded to the old way that things were done. I was Interesting, yeah, because these are powerful pieces and they're kind of marrying the, the, the power of the history that you're bringing to it, as well as the hopefulness of what's on the inside. Exactly. So so the pieces themselves also took on a life of their own. So this is, um, right, so that mezuzah, the barbed wire mezuzah was selected to go into outer space with uh, the first Israeli astronaut, Ilan Ramon. And that happened because of the 1939 club. Um, my mom was on the board and of course my grandparents were longtime members. And Ilan Ramon had met the president, Bill Elperin, and they spoke about what object could he bring into space that would commemorate the Holocaust, given the fact that his own mother was an Auschwitz survivor? So the board was knocking around ideas and then my mom had the idea that maybe this barbed wire mezuzah might be appropriate. And so she brought a picture of it and a little piece that I wrote about it. And the board agreed that there was, there was hope in it, that it was coming from a third generation and it was poignant and beautiful and I should make the piece. And I did make the piece and he did take it to outer space. Although unfortunately the Columbia space shuttle did not make it back in one piece. And we've never seen that piece again. Although there is footage of him holding it in, in the space shuttle. That's a very powerful story. Just for the people listening, what is the 1939 club? Right, so the, some of you may know that 1939 was the year that uh, the Germans invaded Poland and was sort of the kickoff of uh, the final solution, so to speak. And so it's not the greatest club to, to be a part of, but when you're, once you're a, a Holocaust survivor, it means that your community becomes a little bit smaller and a little bit more tight knit. So my grandparents really mostly hung out mainly with other survivors because they could understand, you know, they could be themselves. Right. They could talk about before the war, after the war. So that's what it was. It was, it was a group of Holocaust survivors and their families. Nice. Well, that's a, it's a great story and leads us to your relationship to and in sort of depth of understanding to the mezuzah and, and its contents. Yes. Yeah, so what happened was I shared the teaching of the mezuzah with that group at San Francisco State University, which obviously wasn't a Jewish crowd. And some of my friends in that class also weren't Jewish. And I began sharing the teaching of the mezuzah. So I would, I began making them and making more and more of them and going out into the world with them. And people would be like, what is that? You know? So for the first time, it really gave me the opportunity to share what is a mezuzah and to actually share a really core piece of Judaism. Um, and sometimes in some cases, 
actually sell mezuzot or mezuzah cases to people who aren't Jewish. Interesting. And some people would ask me, you know, why would someone who isn't Jewish want a mezuzah? And I would say, why wouldn't they want a mezuzah if they know what it is? Can they you, may not be commanded to put one up as, as Jewish people are, right. but why not share something so core and so beautiful? So when I looked at these, and I know we chatted a bit about it, it looks very much to me like you have the cloth or the, 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 um, the words, the, the, it's, I don't know, sometimes it's made of fabric, sometimes it's printed paper, sometimes it's um, a variety of different materials, but it looks like it's on the outside, that you can actually touch it. Yes, yeah, so usually a kosher scroll is actually handwritten on parchment. So it might be like goat or something that's specially made. And actually the ink is uh, collected from these trees in Israel and everything is organic material. Uh, but yes, part of the design, the idea around the design was to expose the scroll, to make Judaism just that much more accessible to spiritual seekers, to you know, other Jewish people who don't even know what it is either, had forgotten, hadn't thought of it, thought it was the Ten Commandments in there. Like, what is actually in there? Do people know? People, people out there on the internet, do you know what's in the mezuzah? What does it say? <laughs> exactly. It says we're all one, by the way. It's good. So, uh, it's, it's a good reminder, and um, I think that people forget what it says. Yeah, I, I think it, it's taken for granted. It's kind of like a renewal. It's like renewing this tradition for the, the next generation. And I also looked into whether or not, you know, because I personally am, am a reformed Jew, I'm not Orthodox, but I thought, boy, you know, this is a really religious thing. Maybe, maybe it's not okay for me to share the mezuzah with people who aren't Jewish. Maybe I should check with, you know, some of the more Orthodox. And I did, I, went, I spoke with several Orthodox rabbis around the Bay Area about it. And I came out with their blessing. So I was excited about that. It was very validating. Interesting, because I think a lot of our traditions are mysterious to other cultures. But in fact, as you've shown in your journey, there are more similarities than there are differences. You have to tell us about Japan. Okay, so I'll tell you about Japan. So um, I was already doing lots of mezuzot and studying I began studying more and more Torah and, and many different religious forms. Uh, my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, and I took a trip to Japan. And I was really fascinated by the language of spirituality and the sounds we make with our mouths and how similar they were to some, some Jewish ideas. So I was drawing parallels between sounds in J Japanese and um, sounds in Hebrew that, uh, to me spoke to the divine. So I'll, I'll give you an example. The Hebrew letter Shin, which is depicted um, on the left there, yeah, in two places, yeah. That's always found on the mezuzah. And it's short for the word Shaddai, which, which is like the all-encompassing form of God. And in Japan, I, I realized that there's Shinto religion and there's Shin Buddhism also. And I found some really fascinating parallels between the religions um, around intentionality, entering sacred spaces, um, and various ways of asking and thanking, even just talking about what God is, how you even try to describe God. There are these similarities, and I found it very interesting and inspiring, and it led me to these ideas um, in the Art for Prayer and Peace, A Bridge to Oneness, which is um, an, an exhibit that I'm working on little by little. Which I think we're going to talk about mm -hmm. very soon. I yeah. think we're going to talk about the um, similarities of the shin. Yeah, so, so yeah, pu pushing off on the shin some more. So Hebrew letter shin is the second one in from the left. There it is, shin. And I mentioned it's, it's Shaddai, it stands for the you know, protective aspect of God or the nurturing aspect of God. If you look over to the far left, that is Arabic for Allah, which doesn't sound like Shin, but it looks a lot like Shin. Um, also like the visual of the two looks similar. Um, the root of the word Shaddai in Hebrew is Shad, which means breast. And I think that, I hope you don't mind, but I think that Arabic Allah also looks like a pair of breasts there. <laughs> 
Um, so then moving over to the right a little bit. Yeah, so that's also pronounced shin. And also that bears a resemblance to me to the Hebrew letter shin. But that one is meant to more look like the ventricles of the heart. And so that shin refers to the heart or the core or the center. And sometimes when we talk about God or like the still small voice, you know, that is the, the core. So I feel divinity in that shape and in that sound. And then if you move over one more, yeah, that's another form of shin. And that shin means God, but it's described as everything and nothing at the same time or the spirits or essences of all things and everything, which even though Shinto and, and that version of Shin or God comes from a, a polytheistic religion, those descriptions of God seem very similar to ours. So at some point, it just, the language seems to cut through the red tape to me. And then if you go through one more over, that's another way of saying Shin. And to me, it looks like a lantern. Like I'm dying to make a lantern out of that. Um, and it, it's pronounced shin and it means truth. So I just thought that these were beautiful ways of expressing divine forms um, and using our mouths to express them and language. And it's, it was just one way to sort of open our minds to the fact that, that we're all coming from the same, same God, really. Well, I think this inspired your, uh, your project. Right, so I created this book all about these ideas. And actually I've uh, sent some of the, the book to, I sent it to the Dalai Lama, why not? And uh, you know, you have a 50-50 chance of them responding, but actually I did get a response from the Dalai Lama and he endorsed the work. Um, he said it had potential for bringing religious harmony and peace. And it was just the most unexpected and exciting thing I could ever have dreamed about. Um, and then I also, after that, I figured, well, I might as well. And I sent it to Pope Francis. And he also acknowledged it with a letter thanking me and sending his blessing. So I, I don't know, I felt like maybe there is hope. You know, you were asking at the beginning whether art can change the world. And I thought for a minute, maybe it could. <laughs> I think that we all think by your lead, follow your lead. I think that you've given us a lot to, to think about and talk about it in, in terms of the art that you've created. And I think these are incredible pieces. This is part of your show, correct? Right. So, you know, bridging back from that slide with all those characters, I have the Japanese shin on the left and the Hebrew shins on the right. And those are sculptural Torah crowns. So putting these on the finials of the Torah as it's more of a sculpture, like a functional sculpture, as opposed to actual functional Torah crowns, but that, that is their, their function. And to put Japanese shin on top of a Torah can feel a little bit jarring, I think, for some. Um, but the, the point of it is that it, we're all describing God in a very similar way, whether we're using Hebrew or Japanese. And so the language of it matter, that shouldn't matter so much. It's also communicating to another audience. Like if a Japanese or Chinese person saw that Shin God on top of this rare book, the Torah, they would wonder what is the Torah? Why, why are those, why is that on that rare book? And so that gives me a reason or us a reason to bring out the Torah and open it up and talk about the difference, let's say, between Torah and the Old Testament. So yeah. I know I happen to know you have a Torah in your in your room, right behind. That's right behind room. me there. Yeah. I don't know if you guys can see uh, it. How did that happen? That you have a Torah in your shop? So I thank you for asking. I was a um, a vendor and a speaker at the New Cage Conference, which is a Jewish educators conference in Connecticut. And one of the fellow exhibitors who was next to me was a very Orthodox Jew from New York who moved to Israel, he made Aliyah. And he was in the vendor room selling educational materials for teaching Hebrew. Um, and as I was, he was looking at my work and he was like, wow, you know, this is really beautiful work. I was describing to him what it was like to share the teaching of the mezuzah with people who weren't Jewish. 
and you know about getting the getting the word out about what the Torah is and that, that it's really different from the Old Testament. And so people can actually understand Jews because the people don't know us at all. It's really weird, uh, uh, I feel. So he said, you know, I know of a, a Torah in New York that is not being used because it's faded in some spots and it's considered not kosher enough for reading. And I bet I could, you could buy that for not too much money and you could use it to share Judaism with people who aren't Jewish. So he helped me and I went for it, I bought it. And I brought it to my temple and my rabbi and I went through it and looked at every page and you know, marked off some important areas. And, and he said, you know, we read from Torahs in our temple that aren't as nice as this one. So, so there Very you go. Nice. It's beautiful and it certainly serves the, you know, as an indication of what the power is of graphics and the, really something that you almost can't use words for. You have to perceive, you have to look at the shapes and the forms and then look at the text as a graphic element and it has impact and it has power. It's also a song. So when I've gone and gotten up in front of a, a, you know, a 10th grade class that it's not Jewish and I sang from the Torah and people were enthralled and they were touched by it and they didn't understand a word of it. You know, and then once you talk about what it means and you start looking at the different interpretations through the generations, people can start to appreciate Jews for who they are, you know, so a lot uh, of Jews, yeah. a lot of, you could sing the Torah and a lot of Jews wouldn't know what you're singing either. But they're so. getting it on the musical vibration. That's very true. And that, and that speaks to chanting and right. that speaks to other forms of um, speaking and talking to God. So what, did, what are we looking at here? So this is a one. Of, this is a collaboration I did with uh, the artist Nabila Sajad, and she's an Islamic calligrapher. And those are her paintings there on the right. And they, you can see the the um, Allah there. It looks like a W in the upper left of the paintings. Yeah. Well, no, the paintings are on the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. And I just love the paintings. And and I asked her what they meant, and she said they meant remembrance. That was the name of the pieces. And they were meant to be reminders of the presence of God in, in your life. So when you put them up in your home, it's like, it's like creating sacred space. So I said, oh, it sounds like the mezuzah. She had never heard of a mezuzah before. So of course we had this wonderful talk. And then a little while later, I, I asked her if she would like to collaborate with me on a mezuzah. So she donated the calligraphy, that's on the left, sorry, with the, uh, with the mezuzahs. And actually, it was my husband's idea to pierce out the lettering in a negative space so you can see the Torah through. So that lettering says, in the name of God. And every time I sell one of those, I send a donation to the hand in hand schools in Israel, uh, mm -hmm. which teach the Jew Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And that picture is of Nabila and I, and that's her, her house. She put the mezuzah on her doorpost right behind us. Yeah. Beautiful. So change can happen. I guess. Well, you well, you're working. You're working. <laughs> you're working, and it's working. Tell Thanks. us about the cuff. So that's a recent piece. These are the priestly blessing bracelets, and I have a rabbi who would um, invite the kohenim up on the bima, and I'm bot kohen, so my I come from the the lineage of the kohenim, which are like the high priests. They say they're descended from Aaron. And they, they come to the, to the, to the bima or the altar, you know, the, the stage at the, at the temple. And they, you put your hands up like this and you say this very ancient blessing, may God bless and keep you. And I mean, this, this prayer is in the Torah and I believe it was Aaron who said it. So what happened was I ended up having these dreams um, after doing that a few times, I think it really like moved me. I'd never done it before. I had these dreams about this cuff bracelet that had that Yivarechacha Adonai V'yishmarecha. It had the, the priestly blessing concealed inside the cuff. And the, the dreams were so powerful. I mean, I was like, I couldn't stop thinking about how I would get the lettering on the cuff and what it would look like and how I would make it. And I just became determined and for the first time in a long time, I was felt very driven and I went all out on these pieces and I love them a lot. 
they're very beautiful. I haven't got a great sense of scale for them. Are they, would you say it's a, a couple inches? Big or? like Wonder Woman. Oh, big like Wonder Woman. All right. Big cups, heavy. They're heavy on purpose. Like you're not going to want to put such a thing on and, you know, forget it's on. Right. This is something you would like wear to, to a wedding or to a funeral or to high holy days or, you know, who wouldn't want that blessing? May God bless and keep you. May God grant you peace. To get that as a gift is like so special. Yeah. So, and you know, so as a maker, I really get very happy making these pieces. And they, like I say, they're heavy, they're big. It's a lot of metal. And it, it like, it, it seems like it has applique. So it's like, I got a base layer and then you've layered on top. Do you layer on That's actually levels? raised up. So I, I, there, 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 it is attached, but there's actual air. So that it's like, um, it's not totally flush with the back. So there's a lot of dimensionality. So the pieces are also available without any decoration, just really simple, either bronze or silver. Beautiful. And that has the shin on it. So anyway. Okay. Tell us about Musar. What is it? And what, what is this? What are these bracelets? So, I mean Okay, so I'm in this wonderful group, uh, the Hardly Strictly Jewish Women's Hala group. And we, we make Hala over Zoom. Uh, and it's a, it's, it started with the pandemic and uh, it's grown a lot. And one of the members of the group is a rabbi and she offered a Musar class to us. I didn't take it the first go round. Uh, but a bunch of the women did, and they decided they were so moved by it, they wanted to commission me to make her a gift. So Musar is a 10th century uh, spiritual path in Judaism that uses these soul traits called midot, that you focus on them, and you write about them, and use, you take a couple of weeks, and you try to work on yourself around these midot. So the three midot pictured in the bracelet, the one in the middle, the big one is bitachon. And that means a combination of like trusting and having faith in what's coming towards you. So um, it's kind of like this trust faith thing that you would be thinking about for a couple of weeks. Uh, and then the, another one is rizut. That's the one on the, on the far side. Yeah, 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 zirizut. And that's enthusiasm. So in, the word enthusiasm means to be like inspired, which means to come from God, you know, to come from inside. What inspires you? And can you find balance between being overly enthusiastic or not enthusiastic enough, right? Say no, I would answer no. <laughs> so Musar is all about um, finding the balance. So anyway, those are three midot. I'm working on a fourth one right now, which was a private commission, but I'll add it to the collection. And that one is chesed, which means kindness. What are these? Uh, what am I seeing on the back? Oh, that's my hallmark. That's my stamp. Okay. Yeah. So I have a special stamp, bam, that means that it came from our studio. Very beautiful and powerful. Thank you. So these are a couple of, one of them, I think there's a commission here. Yeah. And, and what's Waves of Love? Where did that come from? So uh, Rabbi Danny Gottlieb from Beth Israel Judea was our rabbi, and he was retiring, becoming Rabbi Emeritus. So we were trying to figure out what kind of gift to give him. And the temple came to me and they said that we want to give him a mezuzah for his new place in um, Nevada. I was going to say Las Vegas, but it's not really Las Vegas. So we were trying to decide what this design would be. He lived in Pacifica. He loved the ocean. We used to do all kinds of programming at the water and at Lake Merced. And uh, he loved Torah study. He loved, he loved us so much. And also his wife, Ricky, they would sing together. And he was just one of those people that had faith no matter what, but it wasn't this contrite faith where you were rolling your eyes. Like he had a brave kind of faith that made you want to believe, you know? So anyway, while we were talking, I was just doodling these ideas of, of the ocean and love. And I came up with this idea during the meeting and I showed everyone and they loved it. And that's, that's what happened. So I made the pieces. There's actually eight different varieties 
and you can order them. And at the time I donated 50% net proceeds to the temple in his honor. And he got the, the only one we made all in silver. And I guess we have to move on. I'm moving you to the paper project. I want to talk about this because I think a lot of people may have seen or heard the story of the paperclip project and tell, tell about your involvement with it. So uh, the paperclip project was uh, in Whitwell, Tennessee. Um, the eighth graders collected uh, paperclips to symbolize the um, passing of the Jews. However many there were, they were going to collect 6 million of them, which is incredible. And they created a, a memorial, a children's memorial in one of the authentic rail cars. You guys have to see the movie if you haven't seen the movie, Paper Clips. So I heard about it from my friend Amy Co. and I was so moved. I asked them if I could make them a mezuzah um, in honor of what they were doing and give it to them as a gift. They were just as nice, if not nicer than in the video um, in person. They invited me to come and bring the mezuzah and speak and they, we had fixed it to their to the uh, their museum. They, I mean, not their museum. They have a library, a Holocaust library that's really amazing, and uh, it was an incredible experience. So I shared the teaching of the mezuzah, and there are no Jews at that school whatsoever. It's all white and Protestant. So we passed around the mezuzah scroll, and we put it up, and we talked about loving God and being reminded, and um, it was a really amazing experience. Is this a pin that went that? Yes, and actually my mother-in-law came with me for that trip too. And, and I was pregnant at the time, just saying. Uh, uh, so that is that paper clip is, is a spin-off project of a curriculum, Holocaust curriculum that's based on the movie. So they'll show clips of the movie and then they have Holocaust curriculum that go with. And it, I think it's designed for middle schoolers. And so I was commissioned to make that pin that they used as gifts for the big donors. Oh, okay. So it's not something anyone can have. This is a special gift. Exactly. Excellent. So now I think we're in a place where we're talking about some commissions that you've done. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the far left, that's the Chai for Hadassah. And so uh, one of the ways that Hadassah raises money is with jewelry. So there's a program called Chai Society, which is kind of geared toward the younger crowd. And if you donate a certain amount, you would get the high and pewter. If you donate more, you got bronze. And if you donated the most, you got silver. And that would be like an annual donation commitment. So you become like a charter member. Uh, the commission in the middle is a tree of life I did uh, for one of the retiring presidents of the Jewish life at Duke, Duke University. So it was a big plaque. And then on the far right is a mezuzah I call a Viva mezuzah, which was commissioned in honor of actually my childhood teacher, um, Cantor Aviva Rosenblum, who is one of the first women uh, cantors in Los Angeles at Temple Israel of Hollywood. She was retiring and I was commissioned to make that piece in silver. And then we did castings of an imputer. And every time I sell that, I give 10% to the Aviva centers in Los Angeles. So you are changing the world. Tell me, tell me a bit more about your tree of life here, because I know we're going to see it in, a, in other uh, iterations, design wise, and I see it's mounted on is that a wood wooden backing there. Yeah, so that's like reclaimed wood, um, you know, trying not to cut down fresh lumber. And uh, the design is a tree of life, but it has Hebrew letter shin in the branches. So I'm pretty, pretty taken with shin. And I love the way you see that shape of shin in nature all the time in plants. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, that, that's what's inspired that shape. I wanna remind people to please put your questions in the chat so that when uh, we have a chance to ask Amy, we'll have your questions. Don't save them to the end because I know we say we'll take questions at the end, put them in now. So when we get to the end, we'll have your questions and, and that would be great. Thank you for that and now, what is going on here? These Are these for the Torah? Yeah, so those were my first ever Torah crowns. And those were for the Women's Torah Project uh, at Kadima in Seattle. And I know Lois Gaylord will be speaking next week. And she she's a member of uh, Kadima. Um, and so I created these crowns and or finials. And really, the design is about communication. Again, sharing Torah. You know, women had not been allowed to 
to write the Torah scroll. And so um, this project essentially helped open the door to women getting trained to become so ferrets or female scribes, which is really amazing, amazing, amazing. And as one of the artists, we got to be really close with the Torah and learn about the ink and, and how it's all sewn together. And uh, so, so those, the design is really about a sharing of, of, you know, Judaism and having a dialogue and bringing, bringing Judaism into the next phase. And actually Lois helped me. I'm just going to give her a little plug here because the crowns themselves, since I was not next to the Torah, when I made the crowns, they were a little too big for the, for the, for the handles. And so she made these inserts for me that were like these padded pillows so that they fit on really well. And she saved the day and I'll forever be grateful to Lois Gaylord. Love you, Lois. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Well, Lois is going to be here in February. So come She's and an hear awesome her. lady. You guys should watch her. <laughs> come and hear her story. So now we're going to look at some other pieces that you have made in your own unique style. What are these pieces? So these are Sadaka boxes. And Sadaka means actually justice. Uh, the secular translation is charity. So this would be a place where you put money to give to people less fortunate. So the idea is if someone has a lot and someone else has a little, when you give, you balance the scales and you create justice. The design on the far right was actually originally commissioned by the Jewish Family and Children's Service of San Francisco. And I, I have one with the rendition of theirs with their logo on it. We didn't put it in this, in this um, slideshow, but that's where that piece originally came from. Um, and so uh, that, that was a wonderful commission and that, that Sadaka box was given to their board members as they left the board or their board president. I, I feel uh, there's a bit of a Japanese feel to it, that sort of the way the, the sides kind of come together, that flare at the bottom. And I do want to comment on a graphic level, your beautiful uh, juxtaposition of the smooth surfaces, the texture, it, it all works together to create a very powerful piece. Thank you. I think it creates a nice balance. Also, that Y looking figure is the Hebrew letter Saudi for Sadaka. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. So I love these because they are so light and airy and yet powerful. So, what is your approach? What were you thinking when you cut these out? So, I created this uh, yard site memorial candle holder after the passing of my grandmother. And I was very, very close with my grandparents. And it was a very difficult transition uh, when they passed. I say they because my grandparents were very close too. So my goal was to make the candle holder in time for uh, her yard site. So it was just essentially drawing the, the design on a flat piece of metal, drilling holes and putting a little tiny saw blade and cutting out all the designs and then forming the piece round and putting a base on it. And I decided that since it meant so much to me, it's probably going to mean a lot to other people. Other people will probably want something like this. It's beautiful. So I had a mold made of it and I do also sell that. So I use it all the time and uh, lots of people use it. It's a popular piece. I want to go through a couple slides because uh, I want to leave time for questions, but I like yeah. this one because it includes this pin. And this pin was part of our promotion for you. And you told me that it had its source of reference during the Second World War. Can you mention where that came from? So actually my dad and I thought of that pin when um, our former president were, was you know, detaining children away from their families at the border and how heartbroken we were and how we were feeling these shadows of the Holocaust coming closer and closer to us. And so we designed this pin and, the, and also the pendant um, that originally we wanted it to help uh, these children that were separated from their families at the border here in the US. Uh, but what ended up happening was we had, we made that, those pieces and they were, ended up being a benefit for the voter participation center. Because we decided if people came out and voted that um, we would be more likely to affect a lot of change across the board, which ended up being true. This is glorious in your use of um, your use of a variety of metals. Can you just remind me? This is your columns. 
you have a, a name. Bars and Windows Menorah. So it was like the, that was an early piece. So it was still kind of rooted in the Holocaust. And so it was like, you know, being behind bars, that idea of being in prison because you're Jewish. But on the same note, the light and the windows, you can actually, there's actually windows cut out behind those candles. So you could see the light through the windows. So it's like the, uh, it like captures both, both this idea of being jailed and also being freed by Judaica by being able to express myself that way. I wanna to get to some of your uh, unique commissions because you used a word when we talked about this, about the intimacy of jewelry. And I'd never thought about it that way before. So if you can just share some thoughts about how you've worked with people to create something that would be so close to their body. Of course, yes. Yeah. So the, that commission that you circled at the bottom, actually my husband and I made those together. Um, for two women who were getting married and it was a long time ago. So that was a big deal then. Um, and, you know, just the idea of commissioning something that's so symbolic and using, you know, in that case, those were heirloom stones. And the one just above that, that was for a mom that was going through a really hard divorce. So the mom was the Ruby and her three kids were the diamonds. And so instead of the wedding ring, she was wearing those, those rings. These are some other wedding jewelry. Yeah. So the necklace, you know, that was commissioned for, uh, that was Stephanie, for Stephanie's wedding. And on the right, the ring from Elisheva, she designed that actually. It was supposed to be designed to look like the uh, California coast. And those were also heirloom stones. And we added the opal to remind yeah. us of the ocean. I know these are some of the pieces that you've made. And this one has a Japanese influence to it with Shaddai inside. Mm -hmm. And you've got your tree of life motif here. Mm -hmm. And the, you know these the, those pieces and some others you know I made a, a while ago and I may or may not keep making them but um, you know they're they're I think pretty and fun and accessible affordable I think so too. So mm -hmm. I want to get to the part where we can ask get some questions for okay. you. So before we do, I'm going to uh, stop at this shop here. Is this a place that you hang out a lot? Mm -hmm. This is my metal art studio that I share with my husband. And um, we have a helper named Anusha and she is wonderful. She's a student at um, the Academy of Art and she's, she's actually Muslim, um, but she comes from a liberal, liberal family and she has an architecture background and she helps us in the studio quite a bit. And this, uh, I'm gonna get Michelle to be, get ready cause I'm gonna call on her in a minute, but this mezuzah, is this how the case opens? Is, are these little hinges? Yeah, so, there's, so sometimes on, on some of the nicer mezuzah, I do a hinge so you can access the mezuzah scroll and change it out. People change it every seven years. Um, mm -hmm. Michelle, do you want to come on and with the questions that you have? Okay, um, I have three questions. And I have a comment as well. So you talked about donating the money to the hand in hand school in Israel. And I just want to remind um, the Temple B'nai Tikva members that we had the direct, the American director from hand in hand um, come to Temple as a guest, of course, many years before COVID. So there's all those connections and, and we learn and how these important organizations you know, keep on coming back to us and reminding us. So that was one of the connections. Now, as for the three questions, um, early on in your presentation, somebody was, um, there were a few people, of course, who were loving the mezuzahs, and they were talking about what materials you were using in your early work, and if the materials that you use now, if that has changed, if you could talk a little bit about that. So my favorite metal to work in for masters and originals and is copper. So copper, the reason why I love copper so much is because it's warm and it behaves a lot like gold, but gold is so expensive that there's a lot of pressure with gold. So it's like working with gold without the pressure. And I love the deep color of it. So no, it hasn't changed a lot. I work in a lot of copper. Copper, gold, and silver are my favorites in that order. But I work with other metals too. Um, but yeah, I really love copper a lot. I, I would call it a precious metal, but there's more of it than the other metals, but it behaves just like them. 
I'm just looking, Jennifer um, sent me a question. Jennifer, we're in sync. I was just going to ask your question. So what the question is, um, you've had wonderful mentors and, and guides in, in your professional career. What kind of advice um, for other artists, specifically um, to find their Judaica voice in their art and how they can you know, share broadly in their community? Wow. Oh gosh. How can you, oh, wow. That's a really great question. I think when you're in services possibly, and you're feeling a particular prayer resonate, um, that may be a time when you might want to explore the meaning, the history of that particular prayer. Um, that's one way. Uh, because that may lead you in a new direction. So just because a piece of Judaica hasn't been made before, doesn't mean you shouldn't make it. Why not make things that haven't been made so that you may lead yourself to a new form of Judaica that way. Another thing could just be scale and your skill set. So, you know, for me, the scale of the mezuzah was a perfect size, you know, so making, um, you know, an arc that holds the Torah would be a huge challenge because that's way bigger than I'm used to working. So you start thinking about what are the things in my medium and in my scale that would bring me that joy and fulfillment and, and that I feel like I'm, I can access my skills best. So that, those might be two things you could think of. I don't know if that helps. I, I think that answers that. Thank you. So the last question I have, not unless somebody sneaks one in really quickly, is right at the beginning, you and it's sort of related to the last question, right at the beginning, you were talking about um, that you teach at the Waldorf School. And um, to me, it seems like your approach, your, your ideals um, really, you know, would suit that. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. So actually, to be quite honest, I resigned from my position not long ago, uh, partially because of COVID. But to tell you the truth, Waldorf education is some of the most wonderful education I've ever come across. It is a way of not teaching in a book, but showing with the hands and with actions and creating an education that means something by doing. So what better way to learn about the elements than to work with copper? So all, the entire ninth grade took copper with me for 15 years. Yeah. So that's just one example of Waldorf education. And I know it may not be for everybody, but I think it's a wonderful, wonderful way to learn. And, and a lot of the education there is art based. It's not an art school, but they use art to teach. So you could use weaving patterns to learn about geometry, for instance, you know, things like that. And they might go outside and look at the reflection of water underneath the leaves of a tree and use that to describe geometry. So it's like you have a visceral knowledge and I honestly think Jew Jewish education, where it doesn't have quite the intentionality of anthroposophy in that way, of Waldorf education, but it gets there. I feel like there, there, there are ways in which Jewish education also uh, gets there. Thank you so much, Michelle. And thank you, Amy, for your very thoughtful answers. And I wanna move now to two things. First of all, I want to take the opportunity to thank you so much for being with us and for sharing. Thank your, you. No, oh, you. <laughs> you are amazing. And for letting us have a trip through the magical world of oneness that you have shown us and you have taught us. So thank you for being our teacher tonight. We're very grateful.